Adapted from Archaic Translation by W.H.D. Rouse. J. Taka No. 192. Siri Kalakani J. Taka. Even though women may be fair, etc. This story will be given in the Maha Amega J. Taka. No. Source. Adapted from Archaic Translation by W.H.D. Rouse. J. Taka No. 193. Kalapay Duma J. Taka. It is I no other, etc. This story the master told while living at Jidavana Monastery about a backsliding brother. The circumstances will be explained in the Ummadanti birth. When this brother was asked by the master whether he were really a backslider, he replied that he was. Who, said the master, has caused you to backslide? He replied that he had seen a woman dressed up in finery, and overcome by passion he had backslided. Then the master said, Brother, womankind are all ungrateful and treacherous. Wise men of old were even so stupid as to give the blood from their own right knee for them to drink, and made them presents all their life long, and yet did not win their hearts. And he told an old world tale. Once upon a time, when King Brahmadatta reigned over, Banaras, the Bodhisattva was born as his chief queen's son. On his name day, they called him Prince Paduma, the Lotus Prince. After him came six younger brothers. One after another these seven came of age and married and settled down, living as the king's companions. One day the king looked out into the palace courts, and as he looked he saw these men with a great following on their way to wait upon himself. He conceived the suspicion that they meant to kill him, and seize his kingdom. So he sent for them, and after this fashion spoke to them. My sons, you may not dwell in this town. So go elsewhere, and when I die you shall return and take the kingdom which belongs to our family. They agreed to their father's words. And went home weeping and wailing. It matters not where we go. They cried. And taking their wives with them, they left the city, and journeyed along the road. In due course they came to a wood, where they could get no food or drink. And being unable to bear the pangs of hunger, they determined to save their lives at the women's cost. They seized the youngest brother's wife, and killed her. They cut up her body into thirteen parts, and ate it. But the Bodhisattva and his wife set aside one portion, and ate the other between them. Thus they did six days, and killed and ate six of the women. And each day the Bodhisattva set one portion aside, so that he had six portions saved. On the seventh day the others would have taken the Bodhisattva's wife to kill her. But instead he gave them the six portions which he had kept. Eat these, said he. Tomorrow I will manage. They all did eat the flesh. And when the time came that they fell asleep, the Bodhisattva and his wife made off together. When they had gone a little space, the woman said, Husband, I can go no further. So the Bodhisattva took her upon his shoulders, and at sunrise he came out of the wood. When the sun was risen, said she husband, I am thirsty. There is no water, dear wife. Said he. But she begged him again and again, until he struck his right knee with his sword, and said. Water there is none. But sit you down and drink the blood here from my knee. And so she did. In due course they came to the mighty Ganges. They drank, they bathed, they ate all manner of fruits, and rested in a pleasant spot. And there by a bend of the river they made a hermit's hut and took up their dwelling in it. Now it happened that a robber in the regions of Upper Ganges had been guilty of high treason. His hands and feet, and his nose and ears had been cut off, and he was laid in a canoe, and left to drift down the great river. To this place he floated, groaning aloud with pain. The Bodhisattva heard his piteous wailing. While I live, said he, no poor creature shall perish for me. And to the river bank he went, and saved the man. He brought him to the hut, and with astringent lotions and ointments he tended his wounds. But his wife said to herself, here is a nice lazy fellow he has fetched out of the Ganges, to look after. And she went about spitting for disgust at the fellow. Now when the man's wounds were growing together, the Bodhisattva had him to dwell there in the hut along with his wife, and he brought fruits of all kinds from the forest to feed both him and the woman. 
and as they thus lived together, the woman fell in love with the fellow, and committed sin. Then she desired to kill the Bodhisattva. And said to him, Husband! As I sat on your shoulder when I came out from the forest, I saw the hill, and I vowed that if ever you and I should be saved, and come to no harm, I would make offering to the Holy Spirit of the hill. Now this spirit haunts me. And I desire to pay my offering. Very good, said the Bodhisattva, not knowing her deceit. He prepared an offering, and delivering to her the vessel of offering, he climbed the hilltop. Then his wife said to him, Husband, not the hill spirit, but you are my chief of gods. Then in your honor first of all I will offer wild flowers, and walk respectfully round you, keeping you on the right, and salute you. And after that I will make my offering to the mountain spirit. So saying, she placed him facing a precipice, and pretended that she was glad to salute him in respectful fashion. Thus getting behind him, she hit him on the back, and hurled him down the precipice. Then she cried in her joy, I have seen the back of my enemy. And she came down from the mountain, and went into the presence of her paramour. Now the Bodhisattva tumbled down the cliff. But he stuck fast in a clump of leaves on the top of a fig tree where there were no thorns. Yet he could not get down the hill, so there he sat among the branches, eating the figs. It happened that a huge iguana used to climb the hill from the foot of it, and would eat the fruit of this fig tree. That day he saw the Bodhisattva and took to flight. On the next day, he came and ate some fruit on one side of it. Again and again he came, till at last he struck up a friendship with the Bodhisattva. How did you get to this place? He asked. And the Bodhisattva told him how. Well, don't be afraid, said the iguana. And taking him on his own back, he descended the hill and brought him out of the forest. There he set him upon the high road, and showed him what way he should go, and himself returned to the forest. The other proceeded to a certain village, and lived there till he heard of his father's death. Upon this he made his way to Benares. There he inherited the kingdom which belonged to his family, and took the name of King Lotus. The ten rules of righteousness for kings he did not transgress, and he ruled uprightly. He built six halls of generosity, one at each of the four gates, one in the midst of the city, and one before the palace. And every day he distributed in gifts six hundred thousand pieces of money. Now the wicked wife took her paramour upon her shoulders, and came on out of the forest. And she went for begging among the people, and collected rice and porridge to support him with. If she was asked what the man was to her, she would reply, his mother was sister to my father, he is my cousin. To him they gave me. Even if he were doomed to death I would take my own husband upon my shoulders, and care for him, and beg food for his living. What a devoted wife! Said all the people. And from then they gave her more food than ever. Some of them also offered advice, saying, Do not live in this way. King Lotus is Lord of Benares. He has set all India in a stir by his generosity. It will delight him to see you. So delighted will he be, that he will give you rich gifts. Put your husband in this basket, and make your way to him. So saying, they persuaded her, and gave her a basket of osiers. The wicked woman placed her paramour in the basket, and taking it up she went to Benares, and lived on what she got at the halls of generosity. Now the Bodhisattva used to ride to an alms hall upon the back of a splendid elephant richly dressed. And after giving alms to eight or ten people, he would set out again for home. Then the wicked woman placed her paramour in the basket, and taking it up, she stood where the king was used to pass. The king saw her. Who is this? He asked. A devoted wife, was the answer. He sent for her, and recognized who she was. He caused the man to be put down from the basket, and asked her, What is this man to you? He is the son of my father's sister, given me by my family, my own husband, she answered. Ah, what a devoted wife! cried they all. For they knew not the ins and outs of it. And they praised the wicked woman. What is the scoundrel your cousin? Did your family give him to you? asked the king. Your husband, 
is he? She did not recognize the king. And yes, my lord. Said she, as bold as you like. And is this the king of Banara's son? Are you not the wife of Prince Lotus, the daughter of such and such a king, your name so and so? Did not you drink the blood from my knee? Did you not fall in love with this rascal, and throw me down a precipice? Ah, you thought that I was dead, and here you are with death written upon your own forehead and here am I, alive. Then he turned to his courtiers. Do you remember what I told you, when you questioned me? My six younger brothers killed their six wives and ate them. But I kept my wife unhurt, and brought her to Ganges Bank, where I lived in a hermit's hut. I hauled a condemned criminal out of the river, and supported him. This woman fell in love with him, and throw me down a precipice, but I saved my life by showing kindness. This is no other than the wicked woman who throw me off the cliff. This, and no other, is the condemned wretch. And then he uttered the following verses. It is I no other, and this queen is she. The handless dishonest, no other, there you see. Said she this is the husband of my youth. Women deserve to die. They have no truth. With a great club beat out the scoundrel's life. Who lies in wait to steal his neighbor's wife? Then take the harlot next. And shear off nose and ears before she die. But although the Bodhisattva could not swallow his anger, and decreed this punishment for them, he did not do accordingly. But he stifled his anger, and had the basket fixed upon her head so fast that she could not take it off. The villain he had placed in the same, and they were driven out of his kingdom. When the master had ended this discourse, he explained the truths and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the backsliding brother entered on the fruit of the first path. In those days certain elders were the six brothers, the young lady Chincha was the wife, Devdutta was the criminal, Ananda was the iguana, and King Lotus was I myself. Source Adapted from Archaic Translation by W.H.D. Rouse Jataka No. 194 Manakora Jataka You gods are here, etc. This story the master told during a stay in Valavana how Devdutta tried to kill him. Hearing that Devdutta went about to kill him, he said, Brethren, this is not the only time that Devdutta has been trying to kill me. He tried to do so before, and failed. Then he told them this story. Once upon a time Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, when the Bodhisattva came to life as the son of a householder who lived in a village not far from the city. When he came to years, they fetched a young lady of family from Banaras to marry him. She was a fair and lovely girl, beautiful as a nymph divine, graceful like a tender creeper, ravishing as a fairy. Her name was Sujata. She was faithful, virtuous, and dutiful. She always did duly her duty to her lord and his parents. This girl was very dear and precious to the Bodhisattva. So they two lived together in joy and unity and oneness of mind. On a day Sujata said to her husband, I have a wish to see my mother and father. Very good, my wife, replied he. Make ready food sufficient for the journey. He caused food of all sorts to be cooked, and placed the provisions in a wagon. Since he drove the vehicle, he sat in front, and his wife behind. To Banaras they went. And there they unyoked the wagon, and washed, and ate. Then the Bodhisattva yoked the oxen again, and sat in front. And Sujata, who had changed her dress and adorned herself, sat behind. As the wagon entered the city, the king of Banaras happened to be making a circuit round the place mounted upon the back of a splendid elephant. And he passed by that place. Sujata had come down out of the cart, and was walking behind on foot. The king saw her. Her beauty so attracted his eye that he became charmed of her. He called one of his suite. Go, said he, and find out whether the woman has a husband or no. The man did as he was asked, and came back to tell the king. She has a husband, I am told, said he. Do you see that man sitting in the cart over there? He is her husband. The king could not stifle his passion, and sin entered into his mind. I will find some way of getting rid of this fellow, 
thought he, and then I will take the wife myself. Calling to a man, he said, Here, my good fellow, take this jeweled crest, and make as though you were passing down the street. As you go, drop it in the wagon of over there man. So saying, he gave him a jeweled crest, and dismissed him. The man took it, and went. As he passed the wagon, he dropped it in. Then he returned, and reported to the king that it was done. I have lost a jeweled crest! cried the king. The whole place was in an uproar. Shut all the gates! The king gave order. Cut off the outlets! Hunt the thief! The king's followers obeyed. The city was all confusion. The other man, taking some others with him, went up to the bodhisattva, crying hello. Stop your cart! The king has lost a jeweled crest. We must search your cart. And search it he did, till he found the jewel which he had put there himself. Thief! cried he, seizing the bodhisattva. They beat him and kicked him. Then binding his arms behind him they dragged him before the king, crying out see the thief who stole your jewel. Off with his head! was the king's command. They lashed him with whips, and made him suffer at every street corner, and throw him out of the city by the south gates. Now Sujata left the wagon, and stretching out her arms she ran after him, wailing as she went Oh my husband, it is I who brought you into this woeful plight. The king's servants throw the bodhisattva upon his back, with the intent to cut off his head. When she saw this, Sujata thought upon her own goodness and virtue, thinking thus within herself. I suppose there can be no spirit here strong enough to stay the hand of cruel and wicked men, who work mischief to the virtuous. And weeping and wailing she repeated the first stanza. No gods are here. They must be far away. No gods, who over all the world hold sway. Now wild and violent men may work their will. For here is no one who could say them no. As this virtuous woman thus mourned, the throne of Saka, king of the gods, grew hot as he sat upon it. Who is it that would make me fall from my godhead? Thought Saka. Then he was wary of what was happening. The king of Benares, he thought, is doing a very cruel deed. He is making the virtuous Sujata miserable. Now I must go there. So descending from the god world. By his own power he dismounted the wicked king from the elephant on whose back he was riding. And laid him upon his back in the place of execution. But the bodhisattva he caught up, and decorated him with all kinds of ornaments, and made the king's dress come upon him, and set him on the back of the king's elephant. The servants lifted the axe and hit off a head but it was the king's head. And when it was off, they knew that it was the head of the king. Saka took upon him a visible body, and came before the bodhisattva, and appointed him to be king. And caused the place of chief queen to be given to Sujata. And as the courtiers, the Brahmins, and householders, and the rest, saw Saka, king of the gods, they rejoiced, saying, The unrighteous king is killed. Now have we received from the hands of Saka a king who is righteous. And Saka stood poised in the air, and said, This your righteous king from this time on shall rule in righteousness. If a king be unrighteous, God sends rain out of season, and in season he sends no rain. And fear of famine, fear of pestilence, fear of the sword these three fears come upon men for him. Thus did he instruct them, and spoke this second verse. For him no rain falls in the time of rain. But out of season pours and pours greatly. A king comes down from heaven upon the earth. See the reason why this man is killed. Thus did Saka address a great assembly of folk, and then he went straight to his divine dwelling. And the Bodhisattva reigned in righteousness, and then went to the heaven. The Master, having ended this discourse, thus identified the birth. At that time Devdutta was the wicked king, Anurata was Saka, Sujata was Rahul's mother, but the king by Saka's gift was I myself.